Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. This is episode number 566. My name is Camden Busey. I'm the pastor of Hope Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Grays Lake, Illinois. And I'm back this week with none other than Glenn Clary, who serves as pastor of Providence OPC in Pflugerville, Texas, which is quite nearby to Austin. Hey, Glenn, how's it going? Great. It's, yeah, glad to be here. Yeah, well, I'm glad to to have you. We're uh, back with a, another important conversation. It's uh, Reformation Day week as we record, so um, it's the day after Reformation Day, November 1st, as we record. This episode is, at least if everything goes well, scheduled to be released uh, November 2nd. And so uh, we've got a few things in store. That timing is a little bit important, not only because it's Reformation Day week, uh, but also because uh, we want to be speaking about a Reformation Day subject and leading up to Glenn Clary's class, uh, which he'll be teaching next week at the Ministerial Training Institute of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Uh, Glenn, uh, t- why don't you tell our, our listeners a little bit about what you're teaching, and th- that'll lead us into our subject of conversation today. Sure, I'd be glad to. So the uh, Ministerial Training Institute of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church is designed to orient men toward ministry in the OPC, and one of the classes that MTI offers is a class on Reformed worship. And uh, so we cover the Reformation of worship in the 16th century. Uh, We talk about the development of Reformed worship since the 16th century to our day, and particularly focusing on Presbyterian worship. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, the original directory for public worship produced by the Westminster Assembly, and then the current directory for public worship that we have in the OPC. And so we, we just talk about Reformed worship. You know, what's the history of Reformed worship? What are the biblical roots of Reformed worship and the patristic roots of Reformed worship? And then how has Reformed worship been practiced in Presbyterianism since the beginning and in the OPC in particular? Now, how long have you taught this class? Is this your second or third time around? Um, I think this is my third time to teach mm-hmm. it. I've been teaching it for a few years. You were in the very first class yeah. I taught. Yeah. I don't remember what year that was. Maybe you remember. I don't. I think it was. <laughs> I think it might have been two years ago or or three. Who knows? I don't. I don't remember. But it's down in Wheaton. But this class is going to be taught in uh, in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Correct. That's correct. That's yeah. enemy territory for me. Oh, is it? Oh, well, sports wise. Sports wise. Sports wise. Yeah, you yeah, know the things that are important. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the important to some. Yeah. So this this will be my third time to teach it. Uh, the first time I taught it, I was following uh, basically the pattern that uh, Larry Wilson uh, had set up for the class. He's the one who taught uh, taught the class. Um, originally, and uh, I succeeded him, and I had the class with him when he taught it, and so I was following his, um, I was following his model in teaching the class. The second time, I took a much more exegetical approach, uh, approaching the subject from a Vossian uh, perspective. Uh, this time, I'm going to try something a little different. So I'm still experimenting with the syllabus. Yeah, uh, change, changing it up each year. Mm-hmm. Uh, this year, I have a small class. So I'm kind of tailoring it around the the small class. Sure. Well, it sounds excellent. I I really appreciated the class myself when I took it, and I I know uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more from you. But we're going to be speaking on the subject today, specifically uh, about Butzer, uh, Calvin, and Knox and their their liturgies. Uh, we we talk about reform. Uh, worship occasionally here at Reformed Forum. It's really important to us, and we are always appreciative of you, Glenn, and your contributions. But today we're going to dive down into some of the the liturgies of the Reformation era, which are important things, and uh, speaking about some of the differences among some of the Reformers and uh, the strengths and weaknesses, perhaps. Uh, But this, this is maybe a new subject to many of our listeners, but one I hope that people will be interested in and, and that this, this subject will perhaps spark some some future interest and in study uh, for people to, to look into these things. So why don't we get started? Uh, Glenn, why don't you let us know some of the, the books that you've used in the class, and this is one of them, uh, the Liturgies of the Western Church. Uh, tell us about a few of these, and, and uh, perhaps some people will want to go out and purchase them. Sure. Uh, I, I use primarily two books uh, for the class that I teach. One is Hughes Oliphant Old's book, Worship Reformed According to Scripture, which is the the standard classic 
introduction to Reformed worship. There really is no other book that's as good as that one, as far as introducing the subject of Reformed worship. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other book that I use is Bard Thompson's Liturgies of the Western Church, uh, which uh, is a bit dated. Uh, and it was, I think, originally published in 1960. Yeah. Uh, but you can st- you can still get copies of it. Would you say it's dated because uh, more research has come to light, so we know more? Or, I mean, certainly, since it's treating a subject from 500 years ago, there's still a lot that's got to be applicable. But... Um, have things changed in, in scholarship that a newer study might be more useful? Yes, uh, certainly. Okay. Yeah, we, uh, you know, there's a, been a tremendous amount of work on Reformed worship since Bard Thompson published his, his book. Uh, Thompson was kind of, he was really a pioneer on that subject. He was the first one to provide English translations uh, to us of many of the Reformed liturgies. Uh, but uh, Dr. Old is another one who has advanced the study of Reformed worship since him. Certainly. And, and, uh, but there are many other scholars who've been working on the history of the Reformation, the history of Reformed worship. And uh, most recently, the most recent book published on the subject, I don't know if you can see this in my uh, camera oh, yeah. here. Well, we discussed that uh, a few weeks ago um, with the authors. It was an excellent we did. Book. Mm-hmm. Uh, Reformation Worship, uh, Liturgies from the Past uh, for the Present, uh, by Jonathan Gibson and Mark Ernge. I think that's how you pronounce Mark's uh, last name. I can't recall. I know we interviewed him, but it's yeah, been a while. Yeah, we, we had this discussion. Yeah. It's either Ernge or Ernge. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Ernge, right. as you say. Right. Uh, two very good brothers, uh, solid uh, you know, theologians, right. uh, very good authors. Uh, but this is a this book is a big improvement over Bard Thompson's work in that it includes many, many more liturgies from the Reformation era, and uh, there are brand new translations of some of those uh, liturgies, uh, some of which are translated into English for the first time, and there are new introductions to each of the liturgies, and so it's a helpful resource to have in studying Reformed worship. I allow uh, my students at MTI to either use Bart Thompson's book or to use this book on Reformation worship, either yeah, one. I They're see. welcome to use either one. Uh, most of them go for Bart Thompson's book because it's shorter. <laughs> 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 Maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but uh, it does cover the basics. And uh, speaking of the basics of Reformed worship, uh, there are three liturgies in particular that I especially highlight in the class mm-hmm. as being the um, Reformation roots of Presbyterian worship. And those th- three liturgies are the liturgies of Martin Bootser, the liturgy of John Calvin, and the liturgy of John Knox. And uh, Bootser is, is really the pioneer of Reformed worship. Uh, he has a profound influence on Calvin with regard to Calvin's liturgical ideas and practices, as we're going to see. And Calvin, in turn, has a significant influence on John Knox, oh, yeah. uh, especially, especially with regard to his liturgical uh, customs. Mm-hmm. And uh, Knox um, takes uh, Calvin's liturgy and adapts it for an English-speaking congregation in Geneva. But then when that Knox pastored, but then when Knox returned to Scotland, he took that liturgy with him, and that became the first liturgy of the Presbyterian Church in 1560 in the Book of Common Order. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's our history, and uh, that liturgy stays in place, stays in effect in, for Presbyterian worship until it is replaced by the Westminster Directory for Public Worship. Yeah, that directory is really significant. Of course, the OPC updated their directory it was about 10 years ago, and um, it wasn't, you know, some people might say there's substantial change, but it's not like we cast off the, the Reformation principles and, and those of the Westminster standards and decided to do something completely different. Uh, but it's helpful to to go in, look at these historic liturgies, to be reminded of uh, the way that our forefathers worshipped, and also the scriptural principles and examples and foundations upon which these are based. Yep, absolutely. And I think maybe it would be helpful if we went through uh, the liturgy of Martin Bootser that was published in 1539 in the Strasbourg Psalter, and then maybe compare that to Calvin's liturgy that he used in Strasbourg and the one he took back to Geneva with him in 1542, 
And then maybe I can make a few comments on uh, Knox uh, liturgy, the liturgy of John Knox, and sure. how it advances the liturgy of Calvin. Let's do it. Uh, so maybe to back up just a little bit and give a little bit of uh, background historically to what was going on in Strasbourg. Uh, in the city of Strasbourg, uh, there were many reformers. Martin Bucer is the most well-known reformer, but he's not the only one, nor is he the first reformer who was there. There were others working at the Reformation prior to him. Uh, Bootser, though, arrived in Strasbourg in 1523, and early the very next year, in February of 1524, the very first liturgical reforms were introduced in the worship of Strasbourg. And uh, Diebold Schwarz, who was a colleague of Martin Bootser, introduced a German mass, and it was soon after published, the German mass. And uh, that year, 1524, several other liturgical changes were made. So the, the earliest um, communion service or German communion service in Strasbourg introduced uh, some very basic changes. Uh, and this is common to the earliest uh, Reformed uh, communion services. The service would be held in the common tongue, the vernacular. And so this was the German uh, communion service. Yeah. Uh, Communion would be served to people in both kinds, meaning they would receive both the wine and the bread. It's quite different the, from Catholic practice, Roman Catholic right. practice. Yeah. So the Roman Mass would have been in Latin, and so they translated the Mass into the common language. They served communion in both kinds, whereas the Roman Church would only give the people the bread, but mm -hmm. not the wine. The priest alone would take the wine. He gets to drink all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Drink ye all of it, right? Yeah, drink ye all of it now, right. <laughs> now. So, um, and the third thing that um, the Reformers did whenever they first started revising uh, worship is they would remove the sacrificial language from the Mass. Uh, all of the Reformers, even though they may have disagreed on lots of other things, uh, and they most certainly did when it came to the Lord's Supper, they all agreed that the sacrifice of the Mass was unbiblical and contrary to the Gospel. And so it was a purified Mass, an expurgated Mass. So the sacrificial pieces were removed from the Mass. Now in uh, 1524, uh, at the very end of the year, I think it came out the day after Christmas actually, Martin Bootser published, on behalf of the Reformers in Strasbourg, a book entitled Grund und Ursach, which means ground yeah. and reason. Mm -hmm. So Bootser was stating the ground for all of the liturgical revisions that had ma been made and the reason for them. So the biblical roots and uh, reasons for making these liturgical changes. Uh, Grund und Ursach, or ground and reason, has uh, just recently been published uh, for the first time in the English language. Um, uh, Otmar Cyprus translated uh, the document into English many years ago in his uh, in his dissertation on Bootser. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Brian Nicholson, who's an OPC minister, uh, had it published, and uh, so it's available if our readers want to read it. And when you say he he published on behalf of all the reformers there in the city, was that something he did kind of with some sort of approval, official approval, or tacit approval, or was he mostly acting kind of? unilaterally, just to provide a reason to the people of why they did what they did? Uh, it's the the former, not the latter. He was he was writing the document on behalf of the other reformers. So in an official capacity, some sort of... Yes, and yeah. it was actually signed by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, oh, 8. Oh, okay. It's, it's signed by eight of the reformers, wow. including including Bootser and some of the others that we would know of. Wolfgang Capito is one who signed yeah. it. Yeah. Um, Matthew Zell, who was an early mm -hmm. reformer there in Strasbourg, and some others. Casper Hedio. Yeah, I read the biography of Bootser uh, not too long ago, but forgot the details on that particular issue. The one by Martin uh, Geschat, uh, I mm -hmm. think it is. Yep. Really uh, nice fascinating one. discussion. A lot of really good, interesting material there in that biography. Uh, yep. Bootser is so important uh, to, to worship, uh, the understanding of a reformed worship and developing that. Oh yes, Butcher. Butcher is really—he's uh, the father or the grandfather, maybe, of reformed worship, and uh, we're going to see that I think as we look at the liturgy uh, more carefully. Uh, but if you look at ground and reason, 
you can see that Butcher uh, builds on uh, the earlier revisions of Diebold Schwarz, and he advances them considerably. Uh, one of the things he introduces is four sung components. Uh, the Strasbourg uh, Christians are now singing psalms and hymns in the service. They sing the Ten Commandments. The Decalogue is sung. Calvin gets that from Bootser. They also sing the Apostles' Creed after the sermon. They sing the Creed. Calvin, again, borrows that practice from Bootser. And uh, uh, you can look at Ground and Reason if you want to see the early uh, order of worship in Strasbourg. Uh, but eventually, uh, the Strasbourg Reformers publish a Psalter, uh, the Strasbourg Psalter of 1537, 1539. 1539 is kind of the definitive edition of the Strasbourg Psalter. And that's what uh, liturgy uh, Bard Thompson uh, has published in his work. And I have a copy of it printed out here. Maybe I can walk us through the service and just make some comments. Uh, yeah, maybe it's helpful. Yeah, please do that. But uh, just maybe for those getting caught up, what, what exactly is a liturgy in this context when you're saying this is their liturgy? Uh, okay. Just Yeah, just maybe some remedial reminders to, to all of us about what we're speaking about. Yeah, very good. I think this is very important, too. Uh, when I use the word liturgy, I'm simply talking about printed guidance for worship, uh, something that is written down or printed that's used uh, as guidance in leading the congregation in worship. And there are different what I call liturgical strategies that are used throughout the history of the church. Uh, one uh, liturgical strategy is what I call an obligatory liturgy, something that's prescribed it's an official liturgy uh, that is prescribed, and sometimes it's enforced through uh, by, by the state, by a, an act of uni uniformity. Uh, and there are three uh, primary examples of an obligatory liturgy. One is the liturgies of the Eastern Orthodox Church, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, for example. Uh, another would be the Roman Rite. Uh, the Roman liturgy, the Latin liturgy, is an, an obligatory liturgy. Even though there are variations of it, it's still prescribed. You still have to read it. And then the third one within the Protestant Church would be the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, the Book of Common Prayer is an obligatory liturgy. It's something that's the official liturgy of the Church of England that's, un that's enforced by means of an act of uh, uniformity, where you have to follow that liturgy. Mm -hmm. or, or it was during the time of the Reformation. Anyhow. Yeah. So what, what so, was uh, in Bootser's? Okay, so Bootser's liturgy is a little different. Uh, Bootser's liturgy falls into another category, the same category uh, that includes Calvin's liturgy and Knox's liturgy. I call these discretionary liturgies. Uh, they're not obligatory liturgies in the sense that they provide forms of prayer that the minister must slavishly follow. He must recite word for word, but rather they provide sample forms for the minister to use in leading in prayer, and they'll provide several different sample forms, uh, but the, the liturgy leaves it to the minister's discretion uh, regarding which form he wants to use, and even when he's using one of the particular forms, he doesn't have to slavishly use it word for word. He can adapt it to, right. you know, as he sees fit. Mm. He has to honor the liturgy. He has to follow the liturgy and honor it. He can't come up with his own liturgy and do whatever he wants to do. And even though if you read Ground and Reason in 1524, Butcher makes the argument that the minister should be able to do whatever he wants to do. He pretty soon backs off on that because ministers started doing whatever they wanted to do. Yeah, and you, they were, you saw yeah. the way it would go. And all of a sudden, oh, <laughs> exactly. I didn't realize you might try so, that. Yeah, right. <laughs> so there, there were all kinds of kooky ideas. You know, the spiritualist in Strasbourg came up with all kinds of uh, funky ways of, of doing worship. So Luther backpedals on that and, and decides we're going to make we're going to have an official liturgy that's not an obligatory liturgy that prescribes mandatory forms, but it's something closer to it. Might that. offer it, some yeah. boundaries or it does provide minimize boundaries, yeah. possibilities of mistakes. This right. is uh, I won't I won't provide the name. I don't think he would care if I did, but I won't uh, just for the sake of it. But this one well-known author says that he's he's opposed to uh, open uh, prayer requests during the service because mm -hmm. he says, "What happens if you get one guy who who asks for prayer because he's lusting over the organist?" <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my. <laughs> Wow, it's a legitimate so. legitimate prayer, but maybe not the right f- format or context to, to issue it. <laughs> right. I've heard something similar to that in prayer requests. I don't think it was that quite that scandalous. But a, I have it, heard something this is a hypothetical. Like this isn't something yeah. that necessarily well, actually happened, but uh, well, yeah. Well, I'll tell you some things that actually really happened sometime, but <laughs> okay. not now, and probably not on the air. <laughs> but um. Okay, so the third category of liturgies, I, I mentioned obligatory liturgies like uh, the Roman Rite uh, Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom uh, or the Book of Common Prayer. I mentioned discretionary liturgies like those of Calvin, Butcher, and Knox. And then the third kind is what we call a directory. A directory is a little different. It has fewer forms. If you look at the original uh, Westminster Directory for Public Worship, it has no forms for prayer. It has an outline, a sketch of what you could include in prayer, but they're not actually forms of prayer. They're very, very easily adaptable for prayer. You can use them as a prayer form with with some slight alteration of wordings. Um, But some of the assembly members, uh, the independents in particular at the Westminster Assembly, uh, were totally opposed to forms. No forms. So um, the Westminster Directory for Public Worship was a compromised document. You know, they had to satisfy as many as they could there. Sure, so I assume you had some on the—if that's what the compromise was, I assume there Mm -hmm. were some many others who preferred the obligatory. Uh, Maybe not obligatory, but certainly— Yeah, there were there were some. For example, um, you know, two of the Scottish commissioners who were there— would have been, you know, pretty happy with an obligatory yeah. uh, lit- liturgy. Uh, the other two Scottish commis- commissioners that we probably are more uh, sympathetic with uh, were opposed to obligatory liturgies, but were perfectly happy to continue using Knox's liturgy, something mm. like. That. I see. So, um, okay, so maybe if I can narrow down just a little bit and talk about uh, worship in Strasbourg and what Butcher gave us mm-hmm. in the the Strasbourg liturgy. So if you look at the Strasbourg Liturgy and Bard Thompson, the very first thing it notes is that there were worship services every single day, three services every single day, and there were three sermons every single day. This this is putting the Dutch to shame. (laughs) You might have five on Christmas week, you know, but... uh, (laughs) But not not seven days a week, three services a day. 21 sermons a week. Yeah. Well, if that's not enough, the first uh, service uh, was scheduled for 4 a.m. in the summertime and 5 a.m. in the wintertime. So this is the early prayer service. And it was a very simple service. It began with a confession of sin and followed by a sermon and then closed with a prayer and benediction. But it was an early morning service they had daily. So that's the first paragraph. Um, if you're looking at Bard Thompson's, that's what you find. <laughs> so we're looking at page 159 for those who have the book, right? Page 159 or 160 or 167. For 167 to get to the actual yeah. example. The chapter yeah. on Bootser is on 159, right. but to, very good, right. very good. So the, the second thing is the second service. This is the late morning service, which is the 8 a.m. service. And then the third service uh, took place around 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. This was the evening service or their Vespers uh, service. So, But but there are three sermons a day, three sermons on the Lord's Day, uh, as we're going to see. Now, the the last paragraph on page 167 talks about uh, the Lord's Day as a holy day. Now, Mm -hmm. there is some nascent Sabbatarianism here. It's not a fully developed Sabbatarianism like you would find uh, among the English Puritans, but there is definitely a nascent Sabbatarianism in in the Strasbourg liturgy. Um, What the uh, Reformer says, or Bootser says here, and I'll just read it, uh, since the holy days are always abused by the common people to do wicked things, and since there are scarcely any days on which God is more disgraced and profaned, let us not insist that any holy day be kept uh, the whole day except Sunday. It is desirable that the weekly day of rest might be kept holy by the worship of God. So Sunday is called the weekly day of rest. So yeah. there's a nascent Sabbatarianism there, and it's holy. It's to be kept holy by specifically the worship of God, public worship. So uh, uh, they did allow, however, uh, for the church to celebrate what Dr. Old calls the evangelical feast days— 
Mm -hmm. And there were typically five of these, sometimes six of them, that were kept during the year. And those were to commemorate the Nativity of Christ, or Christmas, uh, his, to commemorate his Passion, uh, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, and then Ascension Sunday and Pentecost. And sometimes the sixth one would be the, the Day of Circumcision, commemorating the circumcision of Christ. That's mentioned, for example, in the Second Helvetic Confession. Uh, so Heinrich Bullinger and the city of Zurich had that as another evangelical feast day. Now, Butzer says, and it's right here in the Strasbourg Liturgy, that these days are not holy days. Um, we observe them in sermons. In other words, there were already daily sermons going on, already. But what would be preached on on those days commemorated these redemptive historical events from the life of Christ. So they're already daily sermons. There's no other special activity that goes on on these days. And Butcher also says very explicitly here, too, that after the sermon, everybody needs to go to work. So it's a work day. It's just <laughs> oh, an ordinary it's, yeah. Yeah. it's an ordinary work day. Uh, so the only day uh, in the Strasbourg um, Reformed Church uh, at this time in the 1530s, 1520s on, that's regarded as a real holy day is Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, th these other days are, are kept in as commemorative days in which these events from the life of Christ are preached, but there were already daily sermons going going on, and everybody had to go to work as, as usual. Interesting. Okay, so the next thing uh, that happens is uh, Bootser focuses narrowly on what happens on Sunday morning uh, during the— um, Worship services. The early service, the very early prayer service at four or five at five a.m. is kept as normal, just to, just as on every other days of the week. And but the dominical service, this is would be the eight a.m. service, the primary uh, morning service. Uh, he gives very specific directions for how that is to be um, observed. Uh, so Butcher says that the pastor comes into the church. He goes to the altar table. He refers to the altar now as the altar hyphen table. Sometimes he just drops the word altar and uses table. And uh, they actually replaced the literal altar, the concrete altar in the church, um, with a table so that it, it mm. was a table. But he still called it sometimes the altar table. But this is important. The minister would go to the, the Lord's table, and he would lead the worship service from the Lord's table. He doesn't actually go into the pulpit until he's ready oh. to yeah, he doesn't enter the pulpit until he's ready to preach, and uh, as soon as the sermon is over, he comes back to the table. So most of the service is led from, from the Lord's table. Um, the Lord's table is placed uh, near the congregation. The minister is supposed to speak loudly so everybody can hear. Um, and then the service begins with a call to prayer, and this call to prayer is a call specifically to the confession of sin. That's how his service began. So we're not familiar with this in our day. We don't do this anymore uh, in Reformed worship usually. We begin with a call to worship. Right. And we, we usually follow that call to worship with a hymn of praise or something like that, mm -hmm. or an invocation. But that's not how Bootser's service Or start with began. a greeting sometimes. I mean, technically, maybe that's right. before the worship service, but we start with the apostolic greeting often, or salutation, right. and then the call yep. to worship. Right. But there's nothing like that in Strasbourg, nor is there anything like that in Calvin's liturgy or in the liturgy of John Knox. They all begin with a confession of sin. There is an exhortation to confess your sin, so that is a call call to confession. There is a call to prayer, uh, but it's a call to confession. And uh, Bootser gives three different sample prayers of confession that could be used in the worship service. The first two are rather short. Uh, the second one is the one that Calvin uh, liked, and that's the one that Calvin took and put in his liturgy. He adapted it for his liturgy, and John Knox gets it from Calvin. So the second form that's given there uh, is the one that has come down to us in Reformed worship. Uh, maybe I can give just a... a if I can read that second confession there and then make a comment or two about it. And sure. I don't know I don't know how long we are. I don't know how long uh, we've been going, but Doesn't we're already matter to me. <laughs> 30 minutes in. Okay. We yeah, can 30 edit minutes. This. Yeah, we, we can, can always edit. edit. Okay. So here's the second uh, confession that Bootser gives. Uh, 
Almighty, eternal God and Father, we confess and acknowledge that we, alas, were conceived and born in sin, and are therefore inclined to all evil and slow to all good, that we transgress thy holy commandments without ceasing, and evermore corrupt ourselves, but we are sorry for the same, and beseech thy grace and help. So that first part of the confession is an actual confession of sin. The second part is a prayer of supplication. So the prayer of confession is really two parts, a prayer of confession and supplication. The supplication begins in the middle of the paragraph, wherefore have mercy upon us. That's what a supplication is. It's a plea for mercy. Have mercy upon us, most gracious and merciful God and Father, through thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, grant to us and increase in us thy Holy Spirit. Now, you may have noticed the Trinitarianism that's there, right? Have mercy upon us, Father, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant us an increase of your Spirit. Um, There's a Trinitarian structure to this, and I'll explain why there is in a second. Um, That we may recognize our sin and unrighteousness from the bottom of our hearts, attain true repentance and sorrow uh, for them, die to them wholly, and please thee entirely by new and godly life. Amen. Okay, so just a couple of things to point out here. On the prayer of supplication, um, this probably was inspired by the Kyrie eleison, which was in the Roman Mass. The Kyrie means Lord, eleison means have mercy. Mm. So have mercy, Lord. Yeah. Now, in the Roman Mass, or the Latin rite, that the Reformers uh, inherited from the Roman Church and used as a basis for their liturgies, um, following the confidior, which is the Latin term for I confess, which was a confession of sin that was made at the altar by the priest, which was always in the first person, not the plural, until it was changed in the early 16th century uh, in uh, a document published by Surgant, Johann Ulrich Surgant, called the Manuala Curatorum, which I won't, I won't comment on, but it's there in Bart Thompson. You can find other material on it. But anyhow, the priest would confess his sins at the altar, and then the church would sing the Kyrie eleison, which is Lord have mercy. So there's a supplication, right? But he's confessing his own sins, and and I mean that only, not not the sins. Interesting. Right. Well, the the confidior probably goes back to uh, something the priest would do in the sacristy when he's being vested. Yeah. So— it, it originally the confidior was not part of the liturgy proper. It was part of the uh, entrance liturgy, the liturgy that preceded the the liturgy proper. So originally, and then what would happened, there be a, like an introit as a connector or something? Exactly. Okay. Well, the the introit. Okay, so you have um, the introit followed by the Kyrie were originally processional uh, songs or chants. So whenever the priest and his attendants were making their way to the altar, the introit would be sung or chanted and the and the Kyrie. When he arrives at the altar, the Gloria in Excelsis, right, to glo- the glory to God in the highest, would be sung, and that's the opening hymn of the service. So that's originally how, how it occurred. So by the time you get to the 16th century, things have changed a little bit, uh, and the introit and the Kyrie were, were sung at the altar. They were done at the altar. But um, so the reformers, um, the reformers wanted to make sure that the confidior was not a private confession of sin, but a public confession of sin of the whole congregation. The minister leads the congregation in this confession of sin, but it, it's a corporate confession, not an individual, not a private confession. And it's part of the liturgy proper. It's not something you do in preparation for worship. It's something right. you do in worship. It's and that, part of the liturgy. Proper. And that's why the prayer, uh, corporate prayers for ministers, it's my conviction, should be in the first person plural for that reason. I, I think so too. Uh, and Butcher agreed with that as yeah. well. How, however, if you look at the third prayer form, you'll notice mm-hmm. it's still in the first person singular. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I want to comment on that in just a second. But. Um, Okay, so back to the Kyrie. The Kyrie was usually sung three times, uh, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. So it had a Trinitarian structure. Sometimes it was sung nine times, three Kyries, three Christes, and three Kyries, but still has a Trinitarian tripartite structure to it. But that's probably the origin of this prayer of supplication at the end of the prayer of confession in Butzer's, Butzer's liturgy. 
Uh, it, it really is. And Dr. Old makes that argument in the Patristic Creeds of Reformed Worship, I think, pretty convincingly. Okay, so if you look at the third prayer form there, yeah. the third confession of sin, it is a very, very long confession of sin. And what it is is a penitential meditation on the Ten Commandments. And every single paragraph goes through one of the Ten Commandments, and he's confessing, and it is in the first person singular, his breach of that commandment. Now, this is a very good example that this prayer, this penitential prayer, was originally a private penitential meditation on the Ten Commandments mm-hmm. that he has adapted now for public worship. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, um, oh, so it's, it gives us a good example that this was originally a confidior that, w- that was brought into p- public worship. Sure. Okay. So you can almost do forensic, textual forensic analysis on, the, <laughs> on these things <laughs> right. to determine how they right. grew and developed over time and right. how they were used. Right. Well, that's, you know, really Dr. Old's um, dissertation, um, which is the Patristic Rites of Reformed Worship, is a very detailed, meticulous study of these documents and their roots. Where did they come from and how did they develop? Wow. And it's it's so helpful to, to read through it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what happens after the confession of sin? The service proper begins with the confession of sin and Bootser's liturgy. Immediately follow that. Immediately following that is an absolution. So Butcher calls it an absolution or word of comfort, by mean, by which he means a passage of Holy Scripture that comforts us with assurance of forgiveness. Okay, so it's a word of assurance. Now, absolution might uh, offend our sensibilities in our <laughs> right. day, particularly. Right. But all he means by that is a declaration of forgiveness. Yeah. So this this uh, uh, part of worship contains two parts. The first part is a biblical text is read, and he provides a few examples of what kind of kinds of texts might be read. First Timothy one fifteen is the one he uses. John three sixteen, uh, John three thirty five thirty six, Acts ten forty three, First John two one, so on. He gives some examples of. Uh, passages of Scripture that offer us assurance of the forgiveness of sins. And after reading the text is the second part, which is an actual declaration of pardon. And here's how Bootser words it. Let everyone with St. Paul truly acknowledge this in his heart and believe in Christ. So there's an exhortation to believe in Christ and acknowledge your forgiveness, acknowledge the promise of Scripture. Thus, in his name, I proclaim unto you the forgiveness of all your sins and declare to you to be loosed of them on earth, that you be loosed of them in heaven in eternity. Amen. So that's an absolution. And that gives us an insight into how Bootser and the other Reformed uh, theologians thought of the absolution in terms of its biblical roots. They believed that the giving of the keys of the kingdom of heaven by Christ in Matthew chapter 16 and 18 uh, had to do with declaring one's sins forgiven, as Christ put it in John chapter 20, verse 23, or um, pronouncing an excommunication or pronouncing some sort of sh- censure. So it's either the mm-hmm. imposition of a censure on the impenitent or the removal of a censure from the penitent or a declaration of pardon for the penitent. And that's what you have here. So it was a, it was a, a, an exercise of the keys of the kingdom. Is how he understood this declaration of pardon. Now, I, uh, because of you know my own personal scruples about this, I do give a declaration of pardon. I read a verse that assures us of forgiveness of sins, and then I declare a declaration of pardon. But I do it this way: I say something to the effect that to all those who have sincerely confessed their sins and put their faith in Christ, I declare in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that your sins are forgiven. So that qualifies the declaration and applies it only to those who are sincere confessors, who sincerely confessed and believed. Hmm. And I don't, and that's, that's very close to how Calvin did it. uh, As you can see in Calvin's liturgy. Uh uh Now in Bootser's liturgy, immediately after the confession of sin, they would sing a psalm or a hymn. Uh, one example that is given here is Psalm uh, 57, which they call the Miserare, um, or Psalm 51 is sometimes called the Miserare, uh, in, because it's a penitential yeah. psalm. Yeah, wow. Mm-hmm. And um, then following that, um, there would be a prayer, another prayer, 
called the Prayer for Illumination. That's what we call it today, the Prayer for Illumination. And this is when the uh, minister uh, prays uh, a short prayer, as Butzer put it, uh, for a grace and a right spirit that the sermon and word of God, which are to follow, may be heard with profit. Now, I actually skipped something. Um, well, no. So during, yeah, during the, um, okay, there will be a prayer for illumination. Following the prayer for illumination, Butzer does give one sample form for that. There would be another psalm sung. I didn't skip something. Here it is. There would be another psalm sung, and the minister at that point would ascend the pulpit. And once he arrives in the pulpit, the psalm is over. That's when he reads the text of Scripture and gives the sermon. So that's basically what it would have looked like up to the point of the sermon in Butcher's, uh, Butcher's liturgy. Wow. So, yeah, it says here then near the end of the sermon, the minister explains the action of the Lord's Supper. I mean, um, explain that. Yep. Is Has he at this point moved down yet to the table again? He has not. Okay, okay. this is. I think this is a very interesting uh, point, uh, too. Um, there are a few things that, just real quick, if I can back up just a little bit. Okay, so uh, the prayer for illumination precedes the reading of Scripture. Sure. Now, most of our guys will read Scripture today and then pray and then preach. That's fine. I don't really have a problem with that, but my preference is to do the prayer prior to the reading, too. Mm -hmm. following Butcher, Calvin, and Knox, just kind of the Reformed tradition. I think there's <laughs> following Scripture. No. <laughs> yeah, right. Nehemiah chapter 8, you know, Ezra, the scribe, before the reading of Scripture, says that Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and the people answered, Amen, Amen, bowing their heads to the ground, and then he read Scripture. So they saw that the prayer for illumination came before the reading of Scripture. Now, Butcher says here in the Strasbourg Liturgy that on Sunday mornings— he would always preach from the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, he would preach through the Gospels on electio continua, meaning through the whole of the book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, um, rather than following the lectionary. So he completely dispensed with the lectionary, as did Calvin and Knox. The lectionary is not a lectio continua of Scripture, but a lectio selecta, selected readings from various parts of Scripture. So Bootser um, preached through whole books, but on Sunday mornings he always preached the Gospels. On Sunday evenings he usually preached from the Epistles, the other New Testament books, and during the weekdays he preached from the Old Testament books. That was, that was his basic pattern. Um, Calvin did the exact same thing. He learned it from Bootser, and he took it back to Geneva and did the same thing in Geneva. Um, so rarely would they deviate from that. They, they would deviate from that on occasion, but rarely uh, would they do so. Now, that's not a practice that I think we ought to follow. For one thing, we don't have daily, we don't have daily sermons, right? It would be a different if we did. Uh, <laughs> but I think that um, uh, I think that preaching, I think that we have a better understanding today um, of preaching Christ from all Scripture than the early reformers had. They were committed to preaching the gospel, to be sure, uh, but uh, they didn't have as—they had—maybe I can put it this way—their concept of redemptive historical interpretation was underdeveloped, right. and it's something that develops, you know, over time. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly it's there, but it has to be there because they have a covenantal understanding of Scripture, and Christ is the substance of you know, all administrations of the covenant of grace. It's certainly there. Um, but uh, anyhow, now you had pointed out that near the end of the sermon, or at the end of the sermon, it's at that point that the minister begins to explain the Lord's Supper. Now, in Strasbourg, in the cathedral church, the Lord's Supper was held every Sunday. So they had weekly communion in the cathedral church. In the parish churches, they had monthly communion. Now, there are a couple of things that are interesting about that. One is, um, immediately at the end of the sermon, while the minister is still in the pulpit, the conclusion to his sermon, as it were, is an explanation of the Lord's Supper. It's the mm -hmm. communion exhortation. I see. Mm -hmm. and, and Bootser provides a four-point outline of four things that are ordinarily uh, included in this communion exhortation. 
Now, Calvin does the same thing uh, in his liturgy, but he doesn't have weekly communion, obviously, in Geneva. In Strasbourg, he has monthly communion. In Geneva, he wants to have weekly communion, but he doesn't get away with it because the city council won't let him do it. Yeah, that kind of led to a little bit of a problem in his life. <laughs> one of many problems, yeah, in, in his life. And one of many run-ins he had with the city council. Yeah. But uh, as far as I can tell, um, there were other churches, though, in Geneva that were allowed to have communion more frequently. For example, John Knox pastored uh, a congregation of English exiles in Geneva, and they had monthly communion. So the communion on the you know, first Sunday of every month. That's the practice that Knox took back to Scotland, and that's the practice that came out on the first Book of Discipline in Scotland in 1560. Or was whenever. there any, anyone in the Reformed tradition that ever observed it more than once per day on any occasion? Um, not that I know of. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, not that I can recall. But um, Strasbourg is one of the only churches that had communion every Lord's Day in mm -hmm. the Reformed tradition. Um, basically, what had happened was uh, the city of Bern, which is the largest canton in Switzerland, and the city of Zurich, which followed Bern, B-E-R-N, uh, decided they're going to have communion four times a year on, um, on Christmas, on Easter Sunday, on Pentecost, and in autumn, like the first Sunday in September or something like that. On, it, they, on uh, the first Sunday in September, but not on the day of circumcision? <laughs> no, not on the day of circumcision. Wow. But um, but anyhow, um, so they had four time they had communion four times a year. The city of Geneva mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that its political alliance with the city of Bern, which was the largest canton in Switzerland, that's like a not, city state, just for people that might not be aware. Like a city state, right? You know, they're all um, the, that's why they call it sometimes the Swiss Confederation, right? Because it's made up right. of all these like little little nations. Little nations, right? So uh, Geneva wants to make sure that it's following the tradition of Bern in order to maintain a very strong uh, uniformity in worship and therefore alliance politically. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why they insisted on four, four times a year. And that's how come Calvin could not get away with weekly communion uh, there. Um, okay, so... Butzer says that at the very end of the sermon, the minister gives a communion exhortation. He gives four points for how what could be included in that exhortation. I'll just I'll just say this in passing, Camden. Mm -hmm. Some some of those are really interesting to me, especially after the conference we did on Thomas Aquinas uh, and all of the reading I did in Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. Uh, you might remember from uh, Grace Schott's biography that Butzer was a Dominican friar. Yeah. Uh, I think for like 15 years, he was a Dominican. Yeah. And uh, he was very influenced by Thomas Aquinas. Of course we, he would be. Mm -hmm. We know from Butzer's library how many volumes of Aquinas he had and so on. But um, some of Butzer's communion, um, the of the four points in his communion exhortation, sound a little bit like Thomas to me. <laughs> Now, I want to do some more work on that, and one of the reasons I do is Calvin is very influenced by Bootser when it comes to his <laughs> Eucharistic theology, and so is John Knox, and so is Presbyterian. You're really sowing the seeds of anxiety in some of the, <laughs> some, a couple of the listeners out there. <laughs> well, we need to work on, these, work on these things. I think we do, but uh, Bootser, for example, makes a big deal out of um, the incarnation of Christ uh, meaning that the two natures are united to the one person, and how we truly receive the flesh and blood of Christ, uh, who is both God and man, and how that has an effect on us. So that sounds a lot like uh, uh, like Thomas to me, but it, it takes us, you know, uh, apart, uh, takes us away from the topic today. But we can talk about that maybe some other time about the extra Calvinisticum and what that is. Oh, that'd so. be a great conversation. Let's reserve that for the for uh, maybe in a couple weeks or months. So if if on Sundays in Strasbourg, in those churches where they did not have communion every Sunday, they would do their baptisms after the sermon. So you always had word followed by sacrament. Oh, whether it be I'm gonna have to change baptism. that in my church. We typically do our uh, baptisms uh, right. early in the service. Well, we always do the Lord's Supper after the yeah. after the Word. So you know why you do that, don't you? You know what the reason for that is? What? Oh, the baptism? 
Yes, early. Oh, because you got the you got these babies that get all uptight and, exactly. and start crying, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, that's exactly. no reason to change the theology here. <laughs> Right, I agree. Because you always got the visiting relatives who leave after the baptism. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, after the sermon is over and the communion exhortation is given in Strasbourg, they would sing the Apostles' Creed. During the creed, uh, while it's being sung, or right, or right after it, the bread and wine would be brought to the table. Uh, that's when the minister would go to the Lord's table. Uh, he would then uh, lead the congregation in prayer. He provides... Now, this prayer here is very important. It's not just a communion prayer. This is called the great prayer sometimes. Uh, the Dutch call it the long prayer because it's the long prayer. Uh, we call it today often like the congregational prayer or pastoral prayer or something like that. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. But this is this is... The actual kind of prayer that it is, is a prayer of intercession. It begins with the prayers of intercession. And all of the Reformers, uh, well, not all of them, but most of the Reformers in their liturgies will follow this order. They start with 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. They pray for kings, for all who are in authority. They pray for the civil magistrates. That's what Butcher does in his um, prayer of intercession. Butcher then transitions from that to a communion prayer prayer proper. So Butcher provides um, three different forms for the great prayer. The third form is the one that Calvin likes. That's the one that Calvin takes and adds to his liturgy. So Calvin takes this right out of Butcher's liturgy. He adapts it and puts it in his own liturgy, just like he did the, the prayer of confession, one of his prayers of confession. Now, uh, Butcher goes on to say that at the conclusion of this prayer, the minister makes, if he has not already given a communion exhortation, then he does it here. Butcher leaves it to the minister's discretion where he wants to have a, commu- a communion exhortation. But there needs to be one. But there needs to be one. Right. And uh, that is followed by the reading of the words of institution. And then Butcher, whenever he would finish reading the words of institution, would say the following— Believe in the Lord and give eternal praise and thanks unto him. And then he would distribute the bread and the cup. Now, the distribution would have been done in Strasbourg by people coming to the table and the minister standing at the table and serving them and other church officers standing next to the minister helping with the distribution. Uh, During the distribution, uh, Butcher would say to the people who received, remember, believe, and proclaim— that Christ the Lord has died for you. And following the distribution, after the supper, uh, they would sing a hymn, God be praised, or some other psalm. God be praised is one that's mentioned, which was one of the common hymns that were used in Reformed cities. Uh, And then after uh, the singing of the hymn, uh, Butcher would close with a prayer of thanksgiving, which is what he calls it. Uh, Calvin, again, borrows one of these, the very first one that's given in the samples, and Butcher gives three different samples here. The very first one that's given, Calvin takes it and puts it in his liturgy, adapts it a little bit. And then the service ends with the benediction, and the benediction used is Numbers uh, chapter 6. And uh, that's it as far as the Lord's uh, service, as far as the morning worship service on Sunday, not the early morning service, but the 8 a.m. service on Sunday is, is concerned. Yeah, you imagine trying to get people to come <laughs> to a 4 a.m. There's some <laughs> Korean churches around here that have those 4 a.m. prayer services, and there are people oh, that wow. come, uh, well, they might not be four, they're definitely by five, and there are people yep. there every day. They go, it's part of their daily habit and routine where they go and pray before they go to work. It's a really, really neat thing. Didn't Hughes used to do something like that with like a daily prayer service early in the morning or in the evening at Vespers or something for a time in his ministry? He he did try to he did try to add um, prayer services yeah throughout the week and I can't recall exactly uh, how many he was able to to yeah, add and what sure. they did there but uh, speaking of him uh, Hughes Oliphant Old wrote a paper on the Reformation of daily prayer in Strasbourg, and I can't remember the exact title of the paper, but I'll tell you, tell our listeners where it was published. It's published in the Confessional Presbyterian Journal, yeah. the, the journal that features Hughes Oliphant Old, uh, Dr. Old is on the yeah. cover, 
the very first article in there is on, is the one Dr. Old wrote on it. Wow. But basically, his argument is, what did the Strasbourg reformers do with the monastic office, the monastic daily prayer services, uh, like uh, vespers, for example, or the other services? And they would have seven, you know, different offices, daily offices. Well, um, what they did was they kept three of them. They took three of them. And rather than uh, observing them as monastic services, they made them congregational prayer prayer services. Oh. So that's the background to these three ser- daily services. Um, one of the other things I'll mention just very briefly about Strasbourg, they had catechetical preaching every Lord's Day. Mm-hmm. This is uh, not something only done in the Dutch Reformed tradition. Mm-hmm. It's it's done more broadly in the Continental Reformed tradition, including Strasbourg and Geneva. So catechetical preaching yeah. was done. And Butcher says, uh, whenever the minister preaches, and I love the way he puts this, uh, the minister, he says, uh, holds instruction for the children in the cathedral um, he explains to them the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer in succession. Those are the three main catechetical pieces. The Creed is uh, doctrinal catechism, the Ten Commandments, moral catechism, and the Lord's Prayer, liturgical catechism. Those are the three pieces in the Heidelberg Catechism, for example. There are also the three pieces in the Shorter Catechism, except we don't have the Creed, but we do have a theological mm-hmm. section, right? Doctrinal section at the first. Mm-hmm. Um the minister explains these pieces to them in succession, about which he asks them questions and thus drills them in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, or tra- <laughs> trains them, drills them in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And also in Strasbourg, four times a year, they had a general catechetical class for the whole congregation in which they covered those three pieces plus baptism and the Lord's Supper. So the Creed, the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, Baptism, and the Lord's Supper. That's, of course, what we follow in our larger and shorter catechism. The last section is the means of grace and the Lord's Prayer, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, so that's it on the Strasbourg liturgy. Uh, Calvin's liturgy, we've talked about it just a little bit. Uh, Calvin spends three years in, uh, in Strasbourg. Uh, he first goes to Geneva. Um, he's He and Farrell are driven out of Geneva by uh, because of a fallout they have with the city council. Farrell never goes back. Farrell ends up in New Chateau. Uh, Calvin is summoned back. He's uh, requested back by the city council three years later, which I think was 1940 or 19, 1542. Mm-hmm. Um, Calvin reluctantly returns. But when he does, he brings with him a liturgy that he had been using in Strasbourg, because when Calvin was in Strasbourg, he pastored a church of French-speaking exiles Uh in Strasbourg. So Calvin drew up for them a liturgy, based it on uh, Bootser's liturgy, and uh, the actual liturgy in Strasbourg that Calvin produced, we don't have. We don't have the first edition of it anyhow, but we have a 1545 edition. So this is like three years after Calvin left. They were still using this liturgy. Uh, Calvin was succeeded by another French uh, minister. Uh, but we do have a 1545 edition that, that was used in Strasbourg. Um, and so if you look in Bart Thompson's Liturgies of the Western Church, that's what you find. The 1545 edition of Calvin's Strasbourg liturgy and the 1542 edition of his Geneva liturgy. Um, just... Uh, to comment some on Calvin's uh, liturgy. Yeah, uh, they what, ha- page are, what page are we on uh, for those following along for, in, in Thompson? I'm looking at page 197, Yeah, uh, which is the actual liturgical form. So mm-hmm. Calvin calls the Genevan Psalter uh, the form of church prayers and hymns with the manner of administering the sacraments according to the custom of the ancient church. That was very important for the Reformers, not only to point out that they were following the biblical... Uh, teaching, but that they were also following the customs of the ancient church insofar as they were in keeping with uh, Scripture. In uh, in Geneva, they had a daily prayer. Uh, they had daily sermons in Geneva, just like they did in Strasbourg. I don't think they had three sermons every day Slackers. in Geneva. 
<laughs> yeah, they're already slacking here. Uh, but they do have daily prayer, daily sermons, uh, and Calvin's uh, form that's given in the in the Genevan Psalter and Strasbourg liturgy is for the Sunday morning service. So Calvin's service began with uh, a quote from the Psalms, Psalm 124, verse 8, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth, which is known as the Votum. So we call it the Votum. What it actually is is an invocation. He's calling on the name of the Lord. So the service actually begins with an invocation. It's a short invocation, one taken straight out of Psalm, the Psalms, but it is an invocation. That's followed immediately by a prayer of confession, just like Butcher's prayer of confession. Calvin actually takes his form of confession from Butzer. That's followed by the absolution, just like in the Butzer's liturgy. Um, Calvin does the same thing. He reads a verse of scripture that has to do with assurance of forgiveness, and then he declares, here's what he says, let each of you truly acknowledge that he is a sinner, humbling himself before God, and believe that the Heavenly Father wills to be gracious unto him in Jesus Christ. To all those that repent in this wise and look to Jesus Christ for their salvation, I declare that the absolution of sins is effected in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So again, it is an absolution. It's a declaration of pardon, but it's one that is uh, qualified. It's to all those who sincerely repented and, and believe. Now, here, this is interesting. Following the confession of sin, following the declaration of pardon, Calvin's congregation in Strasbourg would sing the first table of the law. They would sing the Ten Commandments, the first four of the Ten Commandments. Now, following that, there was another prayer. And that other prayer, the second prayer, is pretty much another confession of sin. It's another supplication. And specifically, he's praying for sanctification. He oh. does. Yeah, so it's, so the idea is, I think the emphasis probably is more so on the third use of the law uh -huh. rather than the first use of the law. The Ten Commandments tell us how to live, but we're praying after we have sung the first table that God would sanctify us by enabling us to live this way. And then following that prayer, they would sing the second table of the law. And while that was being sung, this is in Strasbourg, Calvin would ascend the pulpit. And by ascending, I mean, literally, you have to walk up the stairs. It's Usually a big spiral the, thing, right? I mean, the, stair, right? the staircase would lead up and you'd be quite, quite high in the, in the uh, you know, relative to the floor. Correct. So in these old, uh, in these old cathedrals, uh, you would have a very long nave with some side aisles and there were pillars uh, going down the going down the the nave that you know pillars um, this is the old basilica form and uh, the pulpit would be built on one of those pillars and the stairs would wrap around the pillar so you would ascend the stairs up into the pulpit and then above the pulpit usually there is a, a board a sound board uh, that would cause the deflect the sound downward right oh, I see very good or if the minister was a heretic, it was supposed to fall on him and crush him. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Calvin did say one time uh, something to the effect that if a minister is ascending the pulpit and he hasn't prepared his sermon, it would be better for him to trip and fall down the stairs and break his neck. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, so, um, so Calvin gets in the pulpit. And when he arrived, you know, when the uh, the Ten Commandments have been sung, or in Geneva, when the psalm is finished, uh, he would lead in prayer, the prayer for illumination, uh, just as Butcher did. He would preach the sermon. Again, Calvin followed that Lectio Continua tradition that he received from the earlier Reformers, um, preaching the gospel Sunday morning, epistles Sunday evening, and the Old Testament books during the week. And then following the prayer— Calvin would pray the long prayer, the great prayer, which, again, follows Butcher's pattern, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Calvin's prayer is very long and, in, in fact, includes an extensive paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer. Calvin had already prayed the Lord's Prayer earlier in the service. They actually used the form in the service. Um, 
but he also has a very extensive paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer. So this goes on for several pages in Bart Thompson's uh, book. And uh, then Calvin gives the forms to be used for uh, the Lord's Supper. And uh, just as at Strasbourg, just as in uh, Butcher's liturgy, he leaves it to the discretion of the minister, whether this is done at the end of the sermon or if it's done at the table. Uh, so Calvin uh, says, on those days when the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated, that which follows is joined to the preceding. And so he gives a communion prayer that follows the prayer of intercession. And then let's see. So the, there's the distribution. The distribution in Calvin's church would have been done the, same, done the same way as it was in Strasbourg, where people come down to the front of the church and receive it at the table standing, no kneeling, but standing. And uh, then after the supper, there would be a prayer of thanksgiving. And then after that, uh, there would be uh, a song. A psalm is sung, and then uh, a, dis, a benediction, numbers uh, number six. Uh, so Calvin's forms are there in uh, Thompson, if anyone wants to to look at them. The only other thing, Camden, I think it's worth mentioning here, I think this is really important. Um, since they only had communion every, or since they only had communion four times a year in Geneva, Calvin says uh, that the Sunday before the supper is celebrated, we announce it to the people first in order that each may be prepared and ready to receive it worthily and with appropriate reverence. Second, so that we would not present children unless they are well instructed and have made a profession of their faith in the church. And third, so that if there are strangers who are still untaught and ignorant, they would come to be instructed privately. The day when we celebrate it, the minister touches upon it at the end of the sermon, or if necessary, makes it the entire sermon, an exposition to the people of what our Lord intends to say and signify by this mystery and how we ought to receive it. So I think there are three very important things here. One is, this is the origin of the communion sermon. Mm. Now, communion sermon, of course, is a sermon on the topic of communion. In Presbyterian history, it comes to be called the action sermon because it's the sermon that's preached uh, on the day when the service of communion is held, when it's yeah. actually observed. Is that more particularly in a more of like a Scottish context where the Lord's Supper was observed rather infrequently, maybe three or four times a year? Or well, even it, less? It would have been observed even less, maybe once, once a, a year. Once a year. Yeah. And, and, but that's where... It right. would just seem a little redundant to call it the action sermon if it was every week right. or if it was even every month, perhaps. Of course. So yeah. um, So what happens is Knox goes, okay, so Knox is a minister in Geneva. I think it was four years that he was there. Uh, he learns the practice, the liturgical practices from Calvin. He adapts it for use in the congregation he serves there. He uh, takes it with him back to Scotland in 1560. The Scottish Church officially adopts it in the Book of, Church, Book of Common Order. Uh, however, even though the first Book of Discipline is uh, asking for monthly communion to be observed, I think the second Book of Discipline reduces the frequency down to quarterly. And one of the primary reasons for that is they didn't have enough ministers to serve congregations. And... Uh, even though the second book of discipline, I believe it is, requires quarterly communion, they barely were able to do quarterly communion. They would only be able to do communion maybe once a year. And what they ended up doing is uh, they would have a communion, they would have a communion service where a minister or a group of ministers would go and preach to several congregations who have gathered for communion in a large outdoor meeting. So, like this is the origin of the uh, the camp meeting. Um, they would, they would gather for a very large meeting outdoors, and that meeting would last three or four days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday sometimes would be a day of Thanksgiving afterwards. So the sermons that were preached leading up to Sunday, which is the day they would have communion, were all preparatory sermons. The day of communion, they would preach the action sermon, the communion sermon, and then the day following, if they had a Monday service, would be a day of Thanksgiving. I see. So, 
So uh, if you look, for example, uh, Robert Bruce, who was a Presbyterian minister uh, at the end of the 16th century, I think maybe early 17th century, uh, f- fabulous preacher, Scottish Presbyterian minister. He has left us a whole set of communion sermons. So you have these collections of communion sermons that have come down to us that come from these communion seasons. But um, here's where it began. It began in Geneva with uh, having a preparatory announcement, preparatory practices, getting people ready for communion the next Sunday, and then a communion sermon on the day when you have communion. If you don't do a communion exhortation, then you make the sermon your communion exhortation on those days. And uh, see, what else? There's another thing here. Um, so that's, well, that's that's it, I think, basically. Uh, you have these the idea of a preparatory service and then an actual communion sermon. Eventually, what that becomes is a sermon the prior Sunday that precedes Communion Sunday is a preparatory sermon, and then the sermon on Communion Sunday is a communion sermon. I think that's what you have in the, the Directory for Public Worship, the original. If you look at the Westminster Assembly's Directory for Public Worship, I think that's what it says, as I recall. You preach, you preach a preparatory sermon the Sunday before communion, and then a communion sermon on the Sunday of, of communion. I see. At least do that. I could say more just about the communion, but I, I probably have said enough already. Mm-hmm. The communion service in Calvin, in Calvin's liturgy, has a very lengthy exhortation, which includes a general excommunication, in which he excommunicates everybody. <laughs> Everybody who's living in sin, and he gives a very long list of, you know, sins that would exclude you from the table. Wow. There's a a call to self-examination. Yeah. That that follows that. And uh, then there is an invitation to the supper, and I actually love Calvin's communion invitation. He invites people to come to the table. The only worthiness that God requires of us to be worthy to partake is to recognize our own unworthiness and to find our worthiness in Christ. You know, it's a very beautiful phrase he has there. Um, Calvin uh, is followed very closely, of course, by by John Knox, but not slavishly. I think Knox, in my opinion, uh, Calvin Calvin improves Boots' service. He takes it over, he adapts it, and I think he improves it. But I think Knox even approves Calvin's service. I think Knox's service is better than uh-huh. Calvin's. And especially the prayer forms that Knox gives, mm-hmm. I think they're far superior to the prayer forms of any of the other reformers that we have. There, there was not a better um, writer, author of prayer forms, liturgical prayer forms, than John Knox that I have found in, in the Reformation. Now that's a pretty radical statement because most people don't yeah. think of not don't think of Knox that way at all. They don't associate him with with anything good liturgically. Why do you think there's what makes them superior to you in your mind? Why do why are they superior in your estimation? Well, uh, I think they're superior uh, in terms of their literary style. I think they're superior in terms of their poetic form and structure, the literary style. Uh, some of that may be because they were composed in English and not either in German or French and then translated into English. Uh, I think they're also superior uh, in the biblical use of type typology. For example, uh, I think about it this way. Uh, Knox, Knox kind of saw himself as a prophet. And by that I mean as an Old Testament prophet. <laughs> he really believed he had some sort of prophetic ministry. Uh, and I don't think that's necessarily a, g- a good thing. But one of the effects that that had in terms of his prayers is he would often use uh, the prayers of Scripture and adapt them to his congregation. So his prayer of confession of sin, for example, is taken right out of Daniel chapter 9. Now think about what Daniel is doing in Daniel chapter 9. He's confessing the sins of the whole nation— so Daniel is praying as the voice of the whole nation, the voice of the whole congregation, and it's a prayer of confession for those who are living in exile. Well, what's John Knox doing in Geneva? He's pastoring Christians who are in exile. 
right? Bloody Mary comes to the throne in England and they flee England. They go to Frankfurt and then they go to Geneva and they settle in Geneva. So if you read his prayer of confession, it's just a perfect prayer for that congregation. So that's one reason I think Knox's prayers are superior to Calvin's and Butcher's. Is it has this biblical motif, this biblical typology to it, and Knox seemed to have a really good sense of that, uh, sometimes to his detriment, usually to his detriment. But uh, another thing is, uh, Knox's prayers uh, tend to be much more Eucharistic, his communion prayers in particular. His communion prayers are absolutely beautiful. They're the most beautiful communion prayers we have from the Reformation era. Um, if you read his prayer, the prayer that precedes communion, the prayer that comes before it, it's, it's so full of what we call, in liturgical terminology, a Eucharistic anamnesis. And anamnesis huh. is an anamnesis is a remembrance, uh -huh. a thankful remembrance. And in the Eucharistic anamnesis of the ancient church, the different Eucharistic prayers of the ancient church, there were often these long, hymnic, um, thankful remembrances of the great acts of God in redemptive history, especially in the personal work of Christ, his incarnation, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his uh, second coming, and so on. If you read Knox's communion prayers, it's just absolutely beautiful the way he the way he incorporates that. And I think they're I think they're much better than Calvin's and, and Butcher's even. So that's how Knox takes what they did and he advances it, I think, in, right. in a helpful way. Wow. So in what ways could we recover um some things from Knox and Calvin, even Butzer in our present worship services that perhaps we're not doing, or the manner in which they did them that we don't necessarily follow. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the things we can do when we're studying their liturgies is to think about how they how they structured the service. What they wanted to do was to structure the service around two main parts. There's the ministry of the word followed by the ministry of the supper. So you have pulpit and table. And there's really a balance between those two things in all three liturgies, pulpit and table, especially in Butcher's because they had commun communion weekly. And the bridge between pulpit and table was the ministry of prayer. So you have the ministry of the word, the ministry of prayer, and the ministry of the, of the sacrament. So the main prayer in the service is a prayer that would have come between the gospel being preached and the up the observance of the Lord's Supper. And that's where they prayed the prayer of intercession, the long Eucharistic prayer, the communion prayer, and so on. And uh, so I think that main uh, basic outline of worship is the kind of outline that we ought to follow today. So, And I don't think it has to be slavishly followed, but whenever, you know, if you're a minister or if you're a member of a session and you're looking at an order of worship, uh, you know what the elements of worship are. You know, the elements of worship are the reading, preaching of Scripture, uh, singing of psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, prayer, and the sacraments. But what order do you put these in? You know, do you just come up with any order randomly? I think it's helpful if you have a basic skeleton outline that has two major parts to it, a service of the Word and a service of communion. And I think that the service of prayer really ought to come between it. There can be prayers and should be prayers prior to the sermon. We have a prayer of confession, the first of our service. Um, what I have done for our church here is I've taken the liturgies of Butcher, Calvin, and Knox, and I've adapted them for our use. I don't follow them slavishly. I have adapted them. We start, for example, with a call to worship. We follow that with the doxology. Then we have our invocation just like Calvin and uh, Calvin did, an invocation. And then we have the reading of the Ten Commandments, confession of sin, declaration of pardon, singing of a psalm or a hymn. And then we have the prayer for illumination, scripture reading, sermon. Then we have the long prayer, the great prayer, prayer of intercession that follows it. Uh, I personally like to have a prayer of intercession that's closed with the Lord's Prayer, and then I like to have the creed following that and then a hymn, and then communion. And at communion, I like to do a separate prayer that's specifically a Eucharistic prayer. So this, on that, I kind of, I don't follow 
Calvin and Butcher that closely there because they would include that Eucharistic prayer at the end of their the great prayer. I think it's better to have it at the table uh, for various reasons. But uh, so one of the things we can do is look at their order and look at our order of worship and, uh, you know, compare the two and see which ones are most in keeping with Scripture. The second thing I think we can do as far as using these forms is we can take their prayer forms, like their prayers for illumination or the confession of sin, we can adapt them for our use. You know, whether we have it actually printed out in the bulletin, like a prayer of confession, or we're leading the congregation in prayer, we can use them to help us uh, lead in prayer as discretionary liturgy. It's not that we slavishly follow anything like this, but they weren't intended to be followed that way, but as giving us printed guidance for how we might lead in worship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just a foretaste at uh, so much of the material that's going to be delivered uh, in Columbus, Ohio, next week, where Glenn's going to be teaching at the Ministerial Training Institute of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. So if you're interested in any of that, you can, of course, uh, visit opc.org, not to take this particular class, because there's been a lot of work uh, leading up to the to this point, but you can certainly uh, consider uh, you know the information of the Christian Education website or section of the of uh, the opc.org website. Uh, you can find more and more on reformedforum.org. There's also a section on there that we have called Ancient Reformed Worship, and that's a section of a lot of resources that Glenn has written. And of course, these books, uh, one of which here, Liturgies of the Western Church. Uh, you could pick mm -hmm. up. These are selected and introduced by Bard Thompson. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, so many books by mm -hmm. Hughes Oliphant and Old and Reformation mm -hmm. Worship that Glenn's holding up there uh, mm -hmm. by Gibson and, and Ernji. So there's a lot lot to learn and a lot to do. Of course, you can comment on this episode in uh, the comment thread on our website or even on our YouTube or Facebook pages uh, in response to the to the video that's posted. Or you can email us at mail at reformedforum.org. We can answer uh, directly from the general mail, or we can forward your mail, your email on to uh, the appropriate person. Either way, we hope to get a response out to you. Uh, but I do want to thank everyone for listening. And of course, we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.